everyone and welcome to my video about how to use the Cosé technique in your paintings. Also I will be showing a time lapse for how I created this painting entitled The Octopus and the Grape. I really hope you enjoy it. It's very shiny because I've varnished it. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you're new and let's begin the video. What is the Cosé technique? If you have studied art, whether you're self-taught or not, whether you've been to university, you will know all the history. And if you're new to art you may think that it is kind of hundreds of years old so who cares and also that it sounds quite complex. In actual fact it is easy, it's an easy technique and also you don't have to follow any rules so you can try it without studying any of the past. I will tell you a little bit about it though just in case you're interested. It was started off by many of these old masters, uh, artists that you can look into that employed this technique, Peter Paul Rubens, a great master, and also if you have been to the Sistine Chapel, I've been several times, one of the most beautiful and inspiring places on earth, especially if you're an artist, some of the ceiling fresco is actually painted in with this technique, with an underpainting, a greyish underpainting, and then obviously painted over it. So that in itself should motivate you to want to use it at least once because it is, uh, the Sistine Chapel is like, it's the most beautiful and inspiring place. Michelangelo is one of my favourite artists. I will insert a picture here if I can, if I can get a copyright free one because you know what copyright is like these days. Uh, if I can find a copyright free version of um, some of the Sistine Chapel I will insert it here. Of course it's so enormous and it's painted over years and years and you can see that the quality of the figures and the scenes have a an enormous amount of dimension and they also have this three di three dimensional quality they have an incredible amount of depth and so if you like those ideas and you want to uh, emulate them in your own art then trying the creuset is a great idea for you the word creuset derived from the french i believe cre which is gray but you can also have a brunet, which is brun, which is brown, and you can have a vadaccio, which is a green. So you can have all these different types of underpaintings. You can have a greyish underpainting, a brown underpainting, and a green underpainting. I myself have used the green quite a lot before when I've been creating portraits. And if you wander around uh, your gallery, your art gallery, wherever you are, you will take a look at some paintings that are super old and they have in the portraits a greenish quality to them. If you stand back and you look and think, well, when they catch the light, they look a little bit green. And that is no coincidence, that is on purpose because quite often they were created with a greenish underpainting. And the actual greenish, greenish tone was created using a yellow and a black and I've used this technique myself and I really love the way it comes across. It has an almost ethereal quality and of course a sculptural quality as well. So it's something that I really like and whenever I paint portraits I do try that technique quite often and so it's something that you can think about as well if you're somebody who loves to do portraits as opposed to landscape and animals which I'm showing you in this speed paint. You do not have to use cosé all over your painting, you can certainly just use it in the areas that you want to stand out or that you want to have particular type of dimension. Of course the underpainting will make your subject really really pop and the colours look really bright so that's again is another advantage of using it. I certainly don't use it on all of my paintings, quite often I paint directly in a couple of layers, sometimes even one layer and then that's it, I'm finished. But whenever I'm in the mood I do use this technique and I do really really like it when I have that kind of inkling to use it really, it's just how, I'm, how I feel. And I do think that the Italian Renaissance doesn't really, uh, it doesn't sort of, you don't have to follow those particular rules that they used to, they would use the rosé and then use very thin layers of glaze on top of that. That's a technique that works beautifully, it really does create incredibly shimmering and beautiful looking paintings. But you don't have to use that technique. I didn't in fact, I used more opaque layers after, in fact I think I only used one opaque layer after this, uh, because if you like to speed up your painting process or you just prefer using more opaque layers as opposed to using the glazes, uh, sometimes it depends on the texture of your paint and just how you work with it and how, you, how it feels really. I felt that it would stand up better if I used more opaque layers as opposed to glazing in this case, so that's what I did. About this painting, 
I'm painting an octopus. Once again, I do love painting octopuses. There's something really fascinating and mysterious about them. They live under the sea, quite obviously. They have these massive tentacles and then they go hide under rocks and I always feel like when you're thinking about fantastical magical creatures an octopus just fulfills all those quota they also have these really enormous googly eyes I find to be fascinating <laughs> so I just really love that concept and of course I love anthropomorphic art so to be able to translate an octopus into a to having some human characteristics was fascinating to me. Of course I have done it before. The last time I painted an octopus it was kind of more of a scientist <laughs> and it had some potions and it had this um, incredible you know huge intellect I thought because it had this <laughs> massive dome shape on its head but this one is perhaps a little less intelligent because it's been drinking some wine so perhaps the brain cells have left it and um, it's just kind of having a bit of a relax and I did quite like the idea of trans uh, you know translating it out of the sea and shoving it into a background that is entirely unfamiliar which was sort of a old-fashioned looking somewhat sepia um, forest and it's not so enchanted I, I had an idea of making it enchanted but there wasn't enough space so it sort of ended up being a relatively um, old-fashioned looking forest. <laughs> there, was no, there were no giant mushrooms or magical butterflies or fireflies or dragonflies or whatever it is I normally like to shove in there. There just wasn't space so uh, unfortunately it didn't have quite the um, magical element in the background as I wanted it to but I was super happy with the actual octopus itself and it really looked to me like it was getting drunk which was <laughs> was a great um, ambition of mine before I started the painting. I mean I just had that concept in my head for quite some time and I wanted to put it onto the canvas. I really hope you enjoyed this little discussion about Jose. I really enjoy this technique and I do feel that if you've never tried it before you will it will open your eyes to a new uh, way of working and it's certainly fun to try out. Of course you can try it in the acrylic, you don't have to use oils at all. Acrylic works just as well. In actual fact I have used it in acrylic as an underpainting and then used oils on top and I'm thinking about making a video about that using acrylics and then oils. Um, it's certainly again a different technique and it's something that I was kind of repulsed by when I heard about it initially like how on earth can you mix acrylics and oil but having tried it I now think it is amazing so I do think it's great to look at all avenues of painting and particularly when it comes to techniques so yeah I hope you enjoyed this video don't forget to like and subscribe of course once again I said it twice and I'll see you soon take care guys